Biofilm formation can make or break a candida treatment. So today we're going to be talking about what a candida biofilm actually is, when to suspect it's at play, and the common recommendations that I'll make to my patients when we suspect that a fungal biofilm, a candida biofilm, is actually impeding their progress. That's, that's the reason why they're not getting better. Now remember, this is education only. Just because it's a herbal approach or a nutrient-based protocol doesn't mean that it's gonna be well tolerated. And just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's not strong. Breaking up these fungal biofilms can almost be like opening Pandora's box and then the body's got to deal with whatever you've liberated in that biofilm. So definitely work with a skilled practitioner here. All right, let's dive in. What are biofilms anyway? And we have tons and tons of data on candida forming biofilms, and that's because they have a tendency to form biofilms on medical devices. So whether that is a catheter, a central line, a mechanical ventilator, you know, in the intensive care units, they tend to form on these medical devices and they can be responsible for things like bloodstream infections, pneumonia, and even urinary tract infections with the critically ill. So if we get a little quote for you here, I thought this was really, really enlightening. Biofilms are defined as structured microbial communities that are attached to a surface and encased in a matrix of exopolymeric material. This is of particular significance since it is now estimated that a significant proportion of all human microbial infections involve biofilm formation. Massive, massive statement. That was huge. A significant proportion of all human microbial infections involve biofilm formation. So for me, I'm kind of like a visual learner. I like to kind of picture these uh, biofilms. I'll picture this kind of like impenetrable shield or wall that multiple different members could be back bacteria, could be fungal like candida, can form. They form these little communities and almost build this wall around them. And as they develop and complexify, they can become more of this three-dimensional structure, almost like this city behind a wall. So the most important part here, the reason why we're talking about biofilm formation and candida is because when candida forms a biofilm, it can become very treatment resistant, meaning your frontline therapies aren't working. You're not getting better, right? And I have seen patients throw everything against a fungal overgrowth like candida, whether it's pharmaceutical, nystatin, fluconazole, even kind of graduating all the way up to itraconazole, which is like the big mama antifungal. It's, it's kind of a scary antifungal. It can be helpful for certain patients. Definitely talk to your prescribing doctor there. It's a drug. And even on the natural side of things, oregano oil or undesalinic acid or caprylic acid or horopido, you can learn more about that as an antifungal here. It's one of my favorite ones. Things don't move, symptoms don't improve, and we retest and we find that the lab values haven't improved either, so, so things aren't going according to plan. The frontline therapies are failing, and that's typically when a biofilm has formed that treatment-resistant aspect of the condition is in full force, it's in full effect. So we're gonna get to how I approach treating a fungal biofilm in a second, hang tight. But the big question is, when does a candida bug start to form a biofilm, right? When does that fungal overgrowth switch from being unicellular and doesn't pose much of a threat, not associated with symptoms, over to that more pathogenic form of candida and the really big switch here is moving from unicellular over to that hyphal form of candida and what causes that switch. So there are two circumstances that cause that switch or that flip from harmless to harmful on the candida front and they're pretty broad. You can fill in the blanks for your case, but number one is the immune system is impaired. That is really, really huge, right? And if we think about niches and things that control niches and keep kind of bugs in the right spot, the immune system 
system is huge here. So whatever is impacting your immune system, and that could be a million things, if your immune system's impaired, that fungal overgrowth might make that switch from harmless to harmful, to biofilms, to treatment resistant. The second huge piece here is an environmental niche becomes available. And if we are thinking about the gut microbiome, what would cause an open niche for the microbiome? You shouldn't have to think too long and hard about this. Antibiotics are the most obvious piece there that can cause an opening, right? Because antibiotics are just gonna wipe the slate clear of bacteria that help occupy niches and help kind of defend little pockets. They're gonna wipe all them out, the good and the bad, both gone and in this open terrain, Candida can form into a more harmful variety and start to occupy some of those now vacant niches. Now I find antibiotics to be the most obvious one. Everyone's taken antibiotics. Most of my patients have taken way too many antibiotics and they know it. And the really classic symptom here is I felt worse after antibiotics, you know? So whether I took them and in the moment I might've developed thrush, you know, I was trying to treat a UTI and I wound up with thrush or over time as they kind of compounded and stacked those antibiotics on their timeline, their symptoms gradually deteriorated and became more chronic. So the hyphal form of candida can do a bunch of pretty nasty things. It can attach to host cells. It can damage host tissue. You're the host in this scenario if you have that fungal overgrowth. It can escape from host immune defenses. And as we've covered already, the hyphal form is responsible for the formation of multi-drug resistant biofilm. So we've covered what a biofilm is, think about a little shield, you know, this microbial community with a shield. We've covered why they get formed on that fungal front, you know, immune system gets dysregulated or suppressed, or the microbiome has an exposed niche, think antibiotics there, but diet can be a really big one, stress can be really big, there's a whole bunch of things that can kind of dysregulate the, uh, the microbiome. And then the other really big question is, how do we know that a biofilm has been formed, you know? So far, we can get data on whether you have a candida overgrowth. Something like an organic acids test is a must for any strong suspicion of a fungal overgrowth, but we can't get great data on whether a biofilm has formed. So it's really gotta be in the clinic. How are you responding to treatments? So how to know that there's a candida biofilm? There are three scenarios where I would be starting to suspect a fungal biofilm. Number one would be frontline therapies just aren't cutting it. We are not seeing the improvements in your symptoms compared to the majority of patients uh, that do when we're treating this fungal overgrowth like candida. Number two would be your lab values being extreme. You know, if we suspect you have a candida infection or overgrowth, I would run an organic acids test and you know, if your values are orders of magnitude higher even than your typical candida patient, I would be starting to suspect that a candida biofilm is at play. And then number three, if we've confirmed that it's candida, we know what we're treating, all the symptoms are there, the lab values are there, we're, we're pretty darn sure it's candida picture and you have done round after round after round of antifungals, whether that's pharmaceutical, whether that's natural, whether that's both, and you haven't seen improvements, I would be suspecting a candida biofilm and I would treat that specifically. Now, if this is helpful, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment below, and now we're gonna jump into how to address fungal biofilms, candida biofilms head on. So how to address candida biofilms. We've talked about what they are, how they're formed, when to suspect them. That's really, really huge, because if you don't know they're there, you can just go around in circles for years sometimes. But my approach when we're talking about treating candida is to start with frontline therapies and to think over 
over a timeline of four to six weeks. Could be a bit shorter if it's kind of a simple case, could be a bit longer if it's a complex chronic case, but we really need to kind of start getting out of this kind of like weekly improvements and think more on the months, right? So one round of treatment, it's about, you know, four or five, maybe six weeks, depending again on how kind of strong we're going, how high dose we're going. And that's where I would be looking for significant improvements in symptoms that you originally presented to me with in the clinic. Many of my patients, they've been unwell for years, sometimes decades, and a few of them have just been unwell their whole life. So it's unrealistic to expect things to shift faster than that monthly timeline that really kind of sets expectations and takes the pressure off. You know, one of my patients recently reached out and he said, look, I've been on this plan for three weeks and I haven't noticed a difference. It's too early. <laughs> like, give it a chance, work the frontline therapies, we'll reconnect at that five, six week mark. And if we've seen significant improvements, we just lean in and we keep working that same plan. If we haven't, that's where we either dial things up, address fungal biofilms, or kind of pivot to treating something else. So when we reconnect at that four to six week mark, if you are not 25 to 30% better, then the treatment is not the right one for you, it's not strong enough, or we haven't addressed that fungal biofilm head on. If we're thinking frontline therapies for a candida treatment, I would have most of my patients, definitely all the patients that could tolerate it, on a liquid herbal medicine. So that's about five weeks right there um, at the therapeutic dose. Could take you a while to get there. And then we'd also have them on a prebiotic fiber to kind of help shift and rebalance that microbiome. Very targeted probiotics. And the two top ones here that I love would be Saccharomyces boulardii. And the other really big one would be a spore-based bacillus probiotic. There's a few here in Australia. There's a few on the international markets. They're very, very strong. You might have to go low and slow on those. So really take it easy. If they don't feel good, drop the dose or pause it. We can bring it back in later. And again, we are looking for that improvement over that four to six week mark. And the really, really big herbs that I'd be thinking here, I'm gonna have a whole different video on this for you, but the big ones, clove, thyme, bacon skull cap, oregano, cinnamon, and pomegranate husk, they have all been shown to disrupt or prevent candida from forming a biofilm. So we need to kind of change our little thinking where you need a fungal biofilm disruptor, you know, it's a whole nother product. The liquid herbs, they have good data showing, and I've seen good clinical success showing that they can address a fungal biofilm head on. You don't need an overly complex program if you don't need it, right? And I often say to my patients, we want the noise low and the signal high, and the more products you take, the more noisy it gets. We wanna know our program is working, and if it's not, we pivot and we shift. We don't just stack things on top of each other until you're taking 20 different products. It's too noisy. We don't know what's working there. Now herbal medicines, that's my first place to approach. A fungal biofilm, if we suspect it's there. And if it's a stubborn case, if those lab values are high, if they've been through round and round, you know, those scenarios we talked about, round and round of antifungals with no approach, then I would bring in the first line anti-biofilm or biofilm disruptor, and that would be a fatty acid fraction, whether that's monolaurin, whether that's caprylic acid, or the top of the top for me right here would be undesalinic acid. I've seen really, really good improvements with undesalinic acid combined with liquid herbal medicines, tinctures, they're the strongest antifungals that I have in my dispensary, and I'm looking for strong because we need to move that needle. And so I've done a whole different video on fatty acids as an antifungal, as a biofilm disruptor, and you can check that out here when you have a second. So just to quickly summarize that video, the fatty acids like undesalinic acid or monolaurin, caprylic acid, they can uh, disrupt biofilms. That's number one, that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> but they can also inhibit the conversion of that unicellular yeast 
over to that more aggressive pathogenic hyphal form of candida that's really huge and then the fatty acids also have direct antifungal properties i would not rely on this on its own for a significant candida case i see that mistake being made all the time under selenic acid on its own it's strong it's not strong enough if it's significant. If you've been dealing with these symptoms for longer than a few years, you know, even a few months, I, I don't think undesalinic acid is going to do it on its own. I wouldn't be looking for miracles. It is a huge addition to the program, but it's not going to do all the heavy lifting on its own. So you can see we're starting to dial up the intensity of these antifungal treatments and these biofilm disruptors, right? We're probably at about five at the moment, five out of 10. Herbs on their own, frontline therapies, prebiotics, probiotics, that might be like a three. If it's a significant case, we get the fatty acids in, dialing it up to five. The next level of intervention would be systemic enzymes. And we've got great data showing how these systemic enzymes can help to start to break down, right? I think enzymes are breaking down this biofilm shield. Now I'm going to leave a few links in the description below. Remember to run them by your prescribing practitioner. But the two that I've seen really, really good improvements with would be either biofilm defense by Kirkman Labs, or the other really big one is Interphase Plus by Thayer Biotic. These are pretty pretty darn strong. So I recommend to my patients to take it low, take them on an empty tummy, and if you can time it, which I know is impossible in this busy, busy world, but if you can time it, empty tummy with the enzymes and the biofilm disruptors, and then following it with an antifungal, you know, here we're gonna be using liquid herbal medicines about half an hour later, that's perfect. If you take them both at the same time, no problem. That's not gonna make or break the, uh, the plan. Now here in Australia, we have I Am Biolytic by Bioceuticals Clinical. I've seen some really, really good improvements here. I don't frequently use systemic enzymes. I don't find they're needed, but if a patient is telling me with their symptoms and lack of improvements or extreme cases that they need a biofilm disruptor, Fatty acids like undesalinic acid, we talked about that. Systemic enzymes, you know, Kirkman Labs, the uh, Therabiotics here in Australia, Bioceuticals Clinical, I am Biolytic. Now the problem here for some very, very sensitive patients, and these patients tend to be mold exposed, or they've got mold growing in their digestive tract or their lungs, is that a lot of these systemic enzymes that we use to break up biofilms are derived from mold, things like aspergillus. And so the super sensitive patients, they will not go well on these products. They will react to these products. So just be aware of that. If you are on the extremely sensitive side of things, I would definitely be avoiding something like a systemic enzyme initially. And a really, really kind of key piece here is if you're reacting to something like citrates, right? It's not common, like magnesium citrate, calcium citrate, there is a a patient that reacts to those citrate-based uh, nutrients. And I would start to suspect, ooh, if you are that reactive, which is uncommon, but it's not unheard of, but if you're that reactive, I would actually just shelf those systemic enzymes for now, and I'd bring them back in when you're a little bit more robust. We gotta kinda build you up, build that vitality up before, uh, before we go down that course. Again, because you might react. So if we're thinking about individual enzymes, maybe you reacted to the strong ones, maybe you're just kinda slowly starting to ease in, and you wanna start with individual uh, enzymes which is wise right if you react to it you know what you're not tolerating it's pretty simple <laughs> they would be either serapeptidase natokinase or lumbricanase and even things like n-acetylcysteine or NAC also called NAC that's also a reasonably potent biofilm disruptor again I wouldn't be looking for miracles with any of these on their own but if you have them in a full antifungal program you got the herbs disrupting the biofilms, you got the fatty acids disrupting biofilms and inhibiting conversion, doing all those wonderful things. And then you layer on some of these more systemic enzymes on top. That's where we were, again, looking to kind of dial up the intensity of the treatment. We'd be up at around seven or eight out of 10 with that, uh, with that approach.
So finally, the big mama here, and this is one that I almost considered keeping out because it's so strong and it's so poorly tolerated by some, again, maybe because it's so strong, would be the bismuth thiols. And this really comes from Dr. Paul Anderson. He's done a ton of work on biofilm formation and approaches to treating it and disrupting it. And he's found that when biofilms kick over into these phase two complexes where it's multi-species and it's three-dimensional and it's very established and the bugs have become extremely treatment resistant, that these bismuth thiols can almost form this little wedge and drive into that biofilm to disrupt it. And he's actually found that things like the enzymes and those frontline therapies, things like the herbs, and even the uh, fatty acids, they just won't cut it. So when you're thinking about these cases, start to be thinking about a pretty advanced, chronic, complex cases. These patients have been unwell for years, if not decades, and they've tried round after round of different approaches, and they haven't seen sustained improvements with any of them. So again, I'm gonna have this one in here just for completeness. It's called the Biofilm Phase II Advanced by Priority One, and it's a bismuth thiol, but definitely work with a skilled practitioner when you bring in this biofilm disruptor because it's very strong. Again, if it's an established biofilm, you might be opening Pandora's box and then you're definitely gonna need some form of antimicrobial on board to help your immune system get on top of whatever you've been liberating as your root cause driver of your symptoms. So before we get into the last most important piece, I just wanted to thank you for being here. I know it can be hard going. I know it can be confusing and overwhelming, you know, all this science and all the nitty gritty pieces. If it's been helpful, just subscribe below. It tells me that you're getting something out of this video. And if you have digestive health issues and you live in Australia or New Zealand, then reach out to us here at the clinic. I'd love to hear from you. Finally, the most important thing, and again, something that gets neglected frequently, is antifungals are key. We've talked a ton about biofilm disruptions, and we talked initially about the herbs that can be helpful for disrupting a fungal biofilm, but you need to have some form of antifungal on board, whether that's herbs, probiotics, the undisalinic acid, it could even be a pharmaceutical. Some patients need pharmaceutical antifungals to get them better and you'd have to work with a prescribing doctor there. Now if you're not sure whether it is candida or not then you can check out my video the top five symptoms that make me suspect candida here.